what are you holding on to here? How is this improving your life? How is this making you healthier, more productive? We're too busy, too stressed, under rested, you know, overly stimulated. And I think when you're in that state, it's very easy to live your life on autopilot. The other pitfall that I find myself falling into, and I think is very common, is if someone was to ask me what I think the number one problem in society is, and again, I'm not very good at choosing just one thing when I'm asked that question, but I think I think it's solitude. I think it's the fact that we we have no downtime, we have no space. I think one of the negatives that technology has done for all its positives, one of the negatives is I don't think the negative that's been spoken about enough, which is the fact that it any bit of downtime we previously had has been stolen from us. It's it's been eroded out of modern society because we have something that is going to distract us and it is going to get our attention. These things are wired. Our own feeds with the algorithms, our, your own Netflix accounts, these things are programmed to feed you what is going to give you that dopamine hit, right? You can't compete with that. So if you are chronically looking at this stuff, I think for many of us, it is a distraction. For many of us, it means that we don't have to sit there in stillness and think about our lives. I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm I'm older than you, but I think one thing that we we share in our general age bracket is that to the extent that we are the same general generation, we are the last crop of people who know what it's like to live in a pre-internet world and now live in a fully inter, you know connected world. Our childhood was marked by periods of boredom where we had to go out of our way to figure out creative ways to entertain ourselves. Like the amount of energy that you would have to exude with your imagination to figure out how to spend time was, you know, extraordinary. Fast forward to, you know, the 12 year old now or the 10 year old or the eight year old, they have to exert even more energy to not be distracted, to find boredom, to find stillness. And I think it cannot be overstated how profound a change that is. And I'm not sure that we really appreciate the extent to which that's going to change the course of, of humanity. Because what is that person going to look like in 20 or 30 years when they're an adult? It's going to be a very different type of being. And I think now, uh, more than ever, we're in a uh, crisis of presence in that we never have to be by ourselves ever again, ever, ever. You have to go out of your way to find a moment of stillness. And who was it who said, you know, all of, all of man's suffering can be boiled down to his inability to spend, you know, time alone with himself? I mean, we don't ever have to be alone with ourselves. And I know that I've found myself struggling with this because of how different my life is now from when I wrote my first book. Now there's so many more things vying for my attention. And a lot of those are driven by technology that you have to, you have to move heaven and earth to create boundaries around yeah. that to carve out a few moments of quiet because you're expected to be... Um, you know, accountable and in communication at every given moment of your waking day. I agree that I don't think we recognize the gravity of this. I, 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 I think when we, you know, we're missing a lot of the big picture when we talk about even things like food and sugar, for example, as important as they are, when you understand where a lot of our behaviors come from, you know, we, we unpacked a bit of this when I came on your show, but this whole idea of these underlying stressors in our life and how we then use our certain behaviors to compensate for them. I think a lack of downtime is one of the biggest stressors because if you can't sit alone with your thoughts and you always need distraction, well, you're going to use distraction, whether it's social media, whether it's Netflix, whether it's food, right? So how much of unhealthy food intake is driven 
by an inability to sit and be alone. I think a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think I think emotional eating is is a condition that's under uh, underappreciated. It's easy to dismiss that, like, oh, I'm addicted to whatever kind of food. But you know, I think most people's compulsive eating eating behaviors and patterns are a function of 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 this unconscious drive to change their emotional state, like this reflexive um, need to not feel whatever they're feeling, you know? And I think if you, if somebody was to do a food journal and, or, or, or to posit the question, like, how come I always like, you know, end up, you know, face planting in the Hagen dazs you know, three times a week at midnight or whatever. Like if you were to journal, like what, what happened to you emotionally that day? Like there's triggers for these things, like something emotional, you're, you're feeling, you're experiencing some kind of emotion that maybe you're not even consciously aware of or completely in touch with that is compelling you in an unconscious way to behave in a certain way to change that emotional state so that you can feel different. So whether it's drugs and alcohol or food or the phone or whatever it else, whatever else is, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Yeah. It is a, you know, addictive predisposition to alter your emotional state and avoid having to confront, um, uh, you know, a feeling or an emotion and an inability because of the way we're hardwired to understand that feelings are just that they're feelings. Like when a, when we have an uncomfortable feeling or a, f a fear impulse or something like that, you know, we're hardwired through our amygdala, which we talked about earlier to think that we're, we're in peril, we're going to die. Right. And we're going to act accordingly to redress that. But the truth is it's just an emotion. You're not going to die. And if you can develop the wherewithal to sit with it, to be in that discomfort, you will come to understand one fundamental aspect of emotions, which is that they are constantly in flux and they are not static and it will change and it will pass. But it is only through the willingness to weather through that discomfort that you can become connected to that. And I think we're in a culture right now where nobody wants to be uncomfortable for a minute and everything about society uh, is oriented around luxury and comfort and um, convenience and the idea of having to tolerate even a moment of discomfort is considered you know, something that we're trying to transcend. And yet deep within us, we have a deep need to be in discomfort in order to grow. And I think that's why you're seeing like Spartan races and ultra endurance, like there's what, you know, like if it's all about luxury and comfort and, you know, a, a padded bank account, then why are all these people showing up to climb in the mud, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a, you know, cold Sunday morning. It's because as human beings, we're disconnected from that natural state. And I think the more that we're willing to be in discomfort, the more resilient we become, the more alive we feel, and the more connected to the planet, to ourselves, and to each other we learn to be. So what's the take home for someone who's listening to this and who says, okay, I get it, Rich, I get what you're saying. Um, I recognize your journey. I understand it. I don't think I'm in quite as much pain as you were. So maybe I don't have that motivator to go and make this, make the changes that you have made and make the transformations. Uh -huh. What would you say to that person who maybe doesn't see themselves as, as far gone as let's say you were, yeah. but still wants to make an improvement? How can they use what you just said about discomfort, about being alone with your thoughts is there a practical take home you would give to them? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is I'm sympathetic to, to that situation. In some ways, I think being like a super hardcore drug addict or alcoholic is like a blessing because the problem is so uh, obvious. It's like, oh, what's wrong with me? Well, it couldn't be like Russell Brand always has this joke. He's like, it couldn't be the crack, could it? You know, it's <laughs> like, no, it's not the crack. It's this other thing. You know, it's it's so... It's so glaring that that's your issue. And once you address that, you can course correct. But if, if, uh, you know, if what ails you isn't, uh, 
isn't as acute as that, then it becomes more difficult to diagnose and you can develop a tolerance to just live with it. You know what I mean? And I think that's the saddest place to be because, you know, the alcoholic or the addict is going to flame out and they're going to have to, you know, grapple with their problem and hopefully get beyond it. But you can go all the way to your grave if you have a much lower grade malaise and never really be compelled to confront it. So that's why I say I'm sympathetic to that person because that becomes harder. The pain isn't great enough for them to really do anything about it and they just persist. So my takeaway or suggestion to those people and and look, you know, first of all I want to say like I'm not here to give advice to anybody. You know, I I really go out of my way to try to avoid giving anybody advice. It is not for me to judge anybody's path or the choices they make about their life. All I can do is share my experience. And if that connects with people, that's great. So please, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But I just know from my own experience that the way that I can get myself to feel more alive is to um, carve out time and protect time to do things that I enjoy, first of all. You know, in my case, it happened to be fitness oriented and that turned into ultra endurance. In, 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 you know, the listener's case, it could be anything. It could be painting, it could be stand-up comedy, it could be model trains, it could be anything. But I think it's really important, no matter how busy your life is, to exercise self-care by making sure that you, um, that you, uh, that you do something that you that you love. And if you don't know what you love, try to remember the things that you enjoyed doing as a kid. What were you naturally drawn to? I mean, that's what brought me back into swimming and running. I think that's really important. And I think it's really important to um, step outside your comfort zone and challenge yourself to do something that scares you. And it doesn't have to be some big deal. It can be like you told the story earlier about putting on a wetsuit for the first time and getting in the water. Like that's a scary thing if you've never <laughs> done that. To me, it's nothing because I've been doing that my whole life. But uh, the point being like, just even if you're extending yourself outside your comfort zone a little bit, I think it's important. And I think you'll find it to be incredibly gratifying. And I think it, it also fuels... Um, resilience and an openness to more change and if you're if you can kind of walk that path a little bit i think the universe expands it opens up for you in terms of other opportunities for yourself yeah for sure i mean i think that's some great I advice that was, that was pretty vague but <sighs> yeah i mean that's i think it's helpful i think it's super helpful i think of course like all messages it'll connect with some people won't connect with others, but that's okay. That's the nature of change, right? Change happens when you're ready for that change. We can't make someone around us change. I don't know, since your journey, have you tried to, in inverted commas, make or help people around you change? And have you no. found that to be futile? Yeah, it's it's completely codependent. You can't You can't compel another human being to change. You have responsibility for yourself focus that energy inward and try to be the best version of you, of who you can be. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, and, and stay out of the crosshairs of somebody else's <laughs> trauma or problem. You can make yourself available in a loving way. Um, but I think, you know, and I know this as somebody who's, you know, I've been in the recovery community for a long time. I've gone to a lot of funerals. I've seen people die. I've seen people get sober. I've seen lives transformed and I've seen other people, really struggle and i've been in that position of wanting to help them or extending myself to help help somebody um and i can tell you for a fact that if somebody doesn't want to change they're not going to change they have to want it for themselves willingness is like the entire ball game when it comes to change yeah for sure i think Many of us know when we've, we've found something, we found some insight in our life. We want to share it with those people around us. We want them to get on board with it. But, you know, I, I just stick to my own business these days. I, I try my best just to work on myself, be the example for those people around you. Hopefully you can maybe provide yeah. a bit of inspiration for there's them. A, there's, a, there's an arrogance to that though as well, right? Like, oh, I've discovered this truth and now I want to help you discover yeah. it as well. Um and the way I look at it, the analogy that I use is, I mean, you can run around chasing people, trying to get them to change or see your truth. 
I think it's much more impactful and powerful to to be the lighthouse, to like stand in your strength and you know emit a certain frequency that is your truth. And the people that need to hear that will they will see that beam of light coming from your lighthouse and they will come to you. Yeah. And I think that's what you do with your podcast. Mm -hmm. I think that's genuinely what comes through the airwaves is you are, to me, living an authentic life. You have figured out, you have been through your trials and tribulations and now you have, over a number of years, you're now starting to live a, li a life that is aligned what you you know, really want out of life, what your heart wants out of life, everything seems to me, at least, seems to be a lot more aligned than it probably was. Maybe yeah. there's still growth I mean, to go. Maybe the, there's the, still more alignment to have yeah, come the in. Yeah, the key word is more. You know, like I, you know, like I have plenty of, you know, work to do on myself. You know, so, and that will that will continue for the rest of my life. But you're doing it's not the like, work. But that's that's the key, right? You certainly have. I don't have everything. Fi you, know, I, you know, I don't want to hold myself out as having like answers or as if I've you know figured everything out. You know, my my path is to try to narrow the dissonance between um, between my behavior and my value system, right? So. That I can, so that I can walk the talk, uh, in as close to an aligned state as possible. Like that's the aspiration, right? Um, how can the aspirational self merge with the actual self? That's the biggest game of yeah. all, right? Right. Yeah. That's that's what we're here to do. I believe we're all here to grow and to evolve. And, you know, we work out our shit and our trauma with each other and we do the best that we can yeah. and we do it, you know, mistakenly and, and imperfectly. Um, and I just try to be gentle on myself and gentle with others and a support system to as many people as I can. Rich, you mentioned that all of us to some degree have addiction and I find that incredibly fascinating. Um, I think long and hard about uh, what Gabor Mate talks about. Mm -hmm. I think I very much agree with the majority of his viewpoint, if not all of it, actually. Um, this idea that all addiction at its core is the same and comes from, um, you know, I'm very careful not to sort of misquote him out of context, um, but my perception of what he is saying is that all addiction comes from some form of childhood trauma. And he defines trauma as, sure, bad things that happen to you, but also when not enough good things happen to you as well. I think that's a very important distinction that he makes. So with your own experience of addiction, do you subscribe to Gabriel Mate's view, do you think that's accurate? Do you think that holds true? I guess, as you reflect on your own life, do you think there's a modicum of truth within that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I had Gabor on my podcast as well, and he did what he's fond of doing. I haven't <laughs> listened to your conversation with him, but I would imagine he might've done the same thing to you, which is turn the table and, and yeah. then he, be, he interviews you, right? <laughs> I had a sense that he was going to do that and I wanted him to do that. Like I know like, the feeling. Yeah, I've seen like, it before that as well. What, what please, is he going to Yeah, like I'm going to take advantage of this incredible therapy opportunity session. I have for him to give me therapy. Yeah. And and uh and I went into that resistant to that thesis because as I described earlier, I reflect back on my childhood as as relatively charmed. Now, I was, you know, look, I was bullied and I had, you know, like I was a loner and like I have these other indicia that contribute to, you know, the alcoholic state, but my parents are happily married. My needs were met. You know, we always had a roof over our head and all of that kind of stuff. So when I hear childhood trauma, I don't identify with that. Yeah. And what I needed to learn was the broad definition that he, you know, that he has when he says, trauma. And that important caveat that you pointed out, which is that trauma isn't necessarily something that happened to you. It's something that, you know, was withheld from you or something that you did not get. And through the process of that conversation, he helped me understand that certain emotional needs um, that I had weren't sufficiently met. And that doesn't mean that my parents, who I love very much, did a bad job. 
because what I didn't, what I, what I cannot accept is this idea of vilification of my parents who are very good people and did the very best that they could. What I can accept is this idea that perhaps within the context of them doing their very, very best, there was some emotional need that was not fulfilled that contributed to this later, you know, state, this later condition that I had called alcoholism. I would, however, um, also add that I'm not convinced that that's the entire picture. I do think that there is a genetic component to alcoholism that certain people have a disposition. And, you know, Gabor might say, well, that's a function of epigenetics that goes back, yeah. uh, that, that relates to childhood trauma that you could trace back generations and generations and generations. And I think that's a very appealing concept and perhaps it's true. Maybe we need to you know, understand epigenetics a little bit better to really get behind that. Um, and like I said earlier, I think cert there's certain people that are more sensitive than others. You know, And as somebody who's been in the recovery community for a long time, like I've learned to identify a certain strain of human, you know, like I can spot somebody a mile away walking down the street and I go, oh, that person's in recovery or that person is an, is an alcoholic. Like I can see it, like I can, and maybe that's a function of their childhood trauma as Gabor Mate sees it. But I think maybe the full picture is a little bit more complicated, but I think that model is really important that he's pointed out. And I find a lot of truth in that. And I think he is incredible. And his book, uh, In the Realm of the Hungry yeah. Ghost, is just an extraordinary book that everybody should read. Did you challenge him at all? Um, or did you, I've actually not heard your conversation with him, um, which is rare for me. Yeah, it was a long um, time ago. It was early on in the show, it was yeah. many years ago. Um, were you, did you, were you able to challenge him on that in the sense that this genetic component or, or were you, were you, were you too I was much so, in it? I was, I was super in it and I was emotional. I'm pretty sure I cried. Like it was, yeah. it was heavy. You know what I mean? It was meaningful for me. Um, so no, I mean, look, I can't even remember, but I, I seriously doubt that I challenged him on that. Uh, he did say one thing to me afterwards when we were done and he's like, I think you could benefit from ayahuasca. And if you're interested in that, I would really like to help you. And I can, you know, take, you can come with me on one of these things. And that's something that I found coming up with increasing regularity. I mean, maybe it's particular to Los Angeles and I'd be interested in, in your experience with, um, the quote unquote plant medicine, I've had lots of friends who have done this, um, and I can't dismiss that I think it's had beneficial impacts on people. Um, but I, I don't think that's anything that I'll ever pursue for myself for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, I think it's dangerous to tell an alcoholic or an addict in recovery that the answers they seek can be found in a mind altering substance. That really frightens me, to be honest with you. And if I was to go into it frightened, then maybe that wouldn't be such a good trip. And I think secondly, that that, that experience um, can provide you with a glimpse of what it's like to have a broader spiritual perspective. Um, but I think it's just a glimpse and it's not earned, you know, and I think there are ways to earn that through meditation and mindfulness and these other practices related to spiritual growth that I think would have a more permanent and profound impact in the long term. Yeah, I spoke to Michael Pollan recently uh, when mm -hmm. he was in the right. UK yeah, yeah. Um, about his latest book mm -hmm. and, you know, about, you know, the science about what psychedelics can do for our mental health and from altering our perspective and his own experience through it, from, coming from a, the standpoint of someone highly, highly skeptical. And towards the end, I asked him, um, you know, are there other ways to access that state? He was like, absolutely. There are other ways to get there. Deep breathing, meditation, all kinds of things when practiced regularly, consistently, can also get you to that point. I guess we've all got these emotional layers, right? And trying to figure out who we are. Now, you, you had that instant where those two incidents which forced you, well, 
which motivated you perhaps to change. And I guess one thing I heard you say, Rich, which was which pinged in my ear, because I don't think I've heard you say it before. You said something about alcoholism, and you said I, I, I can't remember v- verbatim. But I think you said something like alcohol was something I used to suffer from, or, or you used it. You said something in the past tense, mm. and why that why that struck me is that, and certainly until recently, I guess I've not heard you talk about this for a while. But would you still say? Would you identify now as an alcoholic? Yes. Yeah, I, that's I, why I, that's why it struck me. Yeah, because you said was. It's interesting. I think. Like I, I'd be. I can't remember what I said, but it would be strange if I used alcoholism in the past tense because I don't think of it in that term, in the, in those terms. Like I'm, I am an alcoholic in recovery. I'm still, you know, sobriety is my number one priority. My relationship with my recovery and my recovery community is, you know, super is the most important thing in my life. It has to come before everything else because if I'm not sober and can't maintain my sobriety, everything else in my life goes away. Uh, so, and and I don't think that, you know, at least in my own, like, again, it goes back to like, I'm not speaking for anybody but myself, yeah. but uh, I have not and don't believe that I ever will graduate from alcoholism. I am an alcoholic in recovery and that recovery process is a daily reprieve. Um, that being said, I don't walk around craving alcohol. Like, it's not like, oh man, you know, like I I think I might drink tonight. Like, it's not like that. Um, that could happen. I do have a daily reprieve from drinking, but it's really about, uh, treating how my alcoholism shows up, um, in my life on a daily basis through my behavior and um, inventorying that behavior and constantly trying to uh, you know better myself and overcome my character defects that emanate from and are a result of this you know alcoholic disposition that I have. Do you think it's possible to leave something like alcoholism behind? I don't know. I mean, I think this this is. Um, it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning about identity and the stories we tell about who we are and these we you know we think of ourselves in a certain way in a strict way like i am an alcoholic this is my identity i'm an alcoholic in recovery can you transcend that i mean i think i'm a spiritual being having a human experience alcoholism is something that i suffer from for me i think it's dangerous to step into a place of thinking that i've transcended this thing and I say that as somebody who, um, you know, I went to rehab in 1998. Uh, so it's 21 years. Um, Since you last had a drink. But at 13 years of sobriety, I had a, uh, like a four hour relapse and had to reset the clock. I've spoken about this publicly on the podcast before. Yeah. Um, and at that moment, after having been sober for 13 years, to pick up a drink was an extremely disorienting and baffling thing that I thought would never, ever wow. happen in my life. And now I can do a forensic analysis on everything that occurred that led me to making that choice. And it involves decisions that I made many, many, many months in advance of that actually happening. And it all has to do with my relationship to my alcoholism. But I th- and, I, and I never questioned whether I was an alcoholic, but I think I had taken my foot off the gas in terms of the actual um, work required in recovery to maintain sobriety that I became vulnerable. And I will tell you this, I took that drink. I, I can't, I, I couldn't tell you why I did it. And it happened so quick. And before you know it, I had like five or six drinks in me. It was like, not a day had gone by since I had stopped drinking and my alcoholism had been doing push-ups in the dark, just waiting for that moment, that vulnerable moment to pounce on me. And it was a very powerful reminder that I very much had not transcended this disease and perhaps may never transcend it. And it gave me, ultimately it was a gift because it reminded me of just how powerful this thing is. 
And the minute I start to think that I've overcome it, I once again become vulnerable. And I think what happens when you have a number of years of sobriety is that you start to relax a little bit and you start to think you have it all figured out and you kind of saunter in and out of the rooms like the guy who's got all the answers and the person <laughs> who gets the phone calls when somebody relapsed and you're going to drop the pearls of wisdom on them. And and what was so great, what was so awesome about this relapse, as demoralizing and humiliating as it was, was that it reframed the whole thing for me and made me realize uh, that how important humility is and how important it is that I make sobriety my number one priority and and that I don't have it all figured out and that I'm constantly learning and I really only have like one day at a time. Yeah, I mean, that is super powerful. You're right, you know, after 13 years, I guess many people around you would have thought, hey, he's he's cracked this thing, mm. he's, he's done, he's out. No. Um, so I guess I would I would imagine there's a certain fear associated with that when you've seen what can happen it's like, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of, I guess, you know, we talk about the stories that we tell ourselves and I guess that is not a criticism of anyone because I tell myself stories as well. I think we have to tell ourselves a story. Coming back to plant medicine, I've spoken to a lot of people who've done it and one of the things they will tell you consistently um, is that you see the world in a different way. You realize that everything we do it's just a story. We've just created a narrative and we can just as easily, maybe not just as easy, but if we, if we want to, we can create a different narrative. So I guess if the story you tell yourself about this is that you are a recovering alcoholic and you're not going to transcend this, I guess in many ways it doesn't really matter, does it? Because, or does it matter? Because you're telling yourself a story that allows you right. it's to not, engage in your life yeah, and be yeah. productive and do the things you want to do, right? I get totally where you're going with this, um, but I think you also nailed my response, which is that's it doesn't matter because it's not going to change my behavior. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm still going to do the things that I need to do to stay sober and that have allowed me to continue to grow. Um, I think what you're getting at is like to label yourself as this, aren't you restricting you know, ultimately the growth that you could, that you could, you know, uh, hey, avail uh, yourself of if you kind of let go of that label. Um, and I, I, I am, and I'm not, man, I, I don't that. want to put, pr I'm not yeah. trying to put pressure on you. I'm, I'm trying to explore this. I find it, I, I find it fascinating. I do not know what it feels like to be on the journey you have been on. I don't know that feeling. I'm this, this, this area fascinates me. Your story fascinates me. And you know, I'm not trying to probe something that you, where you don't want to go. Um, I'll go. I'll go anywhere. Like I think I what you're I th no. I think I think what you're what you're what you're you're dancing around the edges of is a is a really profound question, which is, you know, is it possible to transcend these things? And I think as you know, infinite light beings, yes, I think it is possible. You know, you can become enlightened and 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 no longer be shackled by this. You know this thing we call addiction or, or alcoholism, I would say that I'm not there yet and um, may most likely will never be there. And I'm just trying to get better every single day. But I think, you know, I have to be, um, I have to be respectful and mindful of, you know, the power, uh, you know, the beastliness of this, of this demon that, you know, if, if, if not kept in check, you know, could, could take me down, you know? So, and in order to keep it at bay, there's certain things that I have to do every single day. And they're not that hard and they're not that complicated, but they're super important. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thanks for going there. Um, I think there's a lot we can all learn from that. No matter what challenges we've got in our life, they may seem very distant. They may, they may feel not even on the same page, not even the same book as what you've gone through. But I think, you know, even this idea that a daily practice of something towards something to whatever that focus is i think i think that's a that's a, that's an inspiring story not being able to say no in this current culture means that we feel overwhelmed means that we're often not able to prioritize and do the things that we really want to do we fill it with kind of low value activities so i wonder if you have anything to share with people on you know, how do you say no? How have you got better at saying no? And how are you planning to get even better again yourself? I have, 
uh, navigated this very inelegantly <laughs> and through making lots of mistakes. My default uh, character defect, because I'm also very conflict averse, is that when I get an email that comes in asking me to do something and I realize like I could say yes, but I don't really want to say yes. And if I just immediately responded to it and said, hey, I'm really sorry, uh, it can't happen. I'll have this like tickle that says, well, tell them to check in with you in six months. You know, it's <laughs> That's like, what I do. That's like what the, I do. Yeah, the, you, you leave the, 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 the door cracked open a little bit. Um, not a good idea, right? Like it's okay to just say, hey man, I'm gonna pass, it's cool. Best of luck to you. But I'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll either do that or the worst case scenario is I shove it aside and I say, I'll respond to that later. And quite often I never respond to it, which, al which always inevitably creates a bigger conflict than the one you're trying to avoid in the moment, right? So what I was taught early in recovery was if you're going to eat crow, eat it hot. In other words, like just deal with this stuff as it arises. And, and the process of um, erecting healthy boundaries is very related to self-esteem, right? Like when you feel like um, you're lucky to be getting that opportunity and it might not happen again, you're coming from a place of lack then you're more likely to transgress that boundary. But if you're coming from a place of self-assuredness and a sense that the universe is infinitely abundant and that because you're passing on this opportunity, that is not a reflection on whether you'll get another opportunity, then I think it's easier to just dispassionately say, or compassionately say, no thanks, I'm too busy. And I think the other pitfall that I find myself falling into, and I think is very common, is this sense of guilt. Like, well, I actually do have time. Like, I could make the time. So if I say I don't have time, that's not really honest. But what's helped me reframe that is understanding that when you say you don't have enough time, it's not saying like, oh, I couldn't carve out that hour or whatever it would be. It's that my time is precious, I value it, and I'm already over allocated. And the free time that I do have needs to be spent um, with my friends, with my family, taking care of myself, or with respect to my profession. And it's okay to do that. And I think if people really embrace that, um, it would alleviate a lot of, that's another, stress solution, right? Because I think this causes a lot of stress for a lot of people. You know, when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, right? right? Well, well, what I'll do is if somebody asks me to do something and it's far enough in the future, like I'll agree to anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, can you come and talk at this event in nine months from now on this date? And I'll look at my calendar and it's wide open because it's so happens, far in the future. What happens two weeks before that? And then, yeah, and then, or yeah, like literally like a week, you're like, I can't believe I agreed oh to man, do this thing. Oh man, this is speaking my yeah. language. <laughs> and then I'm constantly, and I'm like, never again. And I'm constantly living in that state of like, I just have to get through this thing that I agreed to do <laughs> so long ago and then I'll be free. And I think that's a, that's a, um, uh, another trap. Rich, you said something there that, um, has really got me thinking when you're coming from a position of a lack of something that can lead to a lot of downstream issues. Right. And I guess, you know, I think, I think one of the reasons I feel quite deeply connected to you, even though this is the second time we've actually met face to face Yes, I listen to you a lot, uh, a huge fan of your show, um, but I see very similar character traits over a number of things that I guess draws me to the things that you're talking about, you know, an inability or a, or, or a uh, trying to work on how to say no better rather than an inability, I should say. Um, being a perfectionist and something you said recently on a podcast or maybe it was a social media post that really went straight to my heart, which is this idea that, you know, when you disagree with a podcast guest, which is, you know, which happens, I always really, I, I have struggled. I'm getting better at what to do in that situation. 
Um, but you know, I've very much come from a place that this is a guest in my home or this is a guest on my show. I want to treat them respectfully. Um, being respectful means not challenging, means listening, being attentive. And I've really gone, I've made huge strides in my own life personally, which I, I hope has been reflected in the podcast where I now feel, hey, disagreeing with someone, uh, respectfully trying to clarify something, respectfully trying to just tease something out and say, hey, well, look, you know, I have a different perspective on that. That's okay. That doesn't mean you're disrespecting someone. Um, so I know this is a trait you've spoken about before. Uh, have you got better, would you say, at challenging your guests when you disagree with them? Yeah. I mean, I'm not an investigative journalist and I'm not having guests on so that I can put them in gotcha situations. Yeah. Uh, and I do have people on the show that I disagree with on certain things, but I also don't go out of my way to find like the controversial guests that we're going to have some kind of huge, yeah. you know, thing like that, that doesn't feel comfortable to me either. Um, but I think, you know, healthy disagreement is healthy, right? Like if you're going to talk to somebody for two hours, uh, if you're just saying, that's awesome. And I agree and amazing to everything they say, that's going to be a pretty stagnant conversation, right? Uh, and you're not being disrespectful to say, you could do it in a compassionate way. You don't have to be combative about exactly. it. But if you're like, if you lead with curiosity and say, tell me more about that, or like, did you think of it from this angle? Or I've always thought it was like this, explain to me like why I might not be seeing it your way. Like there are ways in to explore those differences and do it in a deferential way. And I think right now it's critical that we find ways to do that because we're in a situation in which dialogue and discourse has been fractured and people have decamped to their respective fiefdoms and surrounded themselves with news feeds that just reinforce their point of view. And the idea that you would cross that aisle and entertain a perspective from somebody who's not part of your tribe is anathema. And I think when you're operating under that perspective, you're participating in what I think is ultimately the denigration and, and, and destruction of de democratic society. You know, free speech um, is important, respect is important, and being able to communicate with people that you don't see eye to eye to is absolutely vital for a healthy society. I got an Instagram direct message just a few hours ago. Um, I think I read it in the Uber on the way here, actually, from someone who listens to this show and said, Dr. Chastity, um, I wonder if you could do a podcast on how to handle the political discourse that is going on in the world at the moment, how to handle this toxicity. This stresses me out every day. I feel really pessimistic about the state of the world. Um, I don't know what to do about it. It's having a negative impact on my health. And I thought about it. I thought, that's a really great idea. Let me think about how I could have that conversation. Let me think about a guest who I might be able to talk to about that. Mm. But I actually, <laughs> I, I suspect you may have a lot to offer there. You know, what's, you know, what advice would you give to that lady who is struggling to navigate this toxic political discourse that if you consume the media, if you consume the mainstream media, which generally speaking, I do not anymore. Mm -hmm. If you choose to do that, what can somebody do? Well, I think a couple things. First of all, to reiterate what you just said, you don't need to be consuming that. And if you feel compelled to consume it because to do otherwise would mean that you're not participating in society, I think is an illusion. We have this idea that we need to be watching the nightly news every night, or we need to be consuming the 24 hour news cycle. And I would submit to that person that they should really question the value of that right? Like how much is being completely up to speed on everything in the news cycle contributing to your life? Or how much is it, um, you know, contributing to, uh, you know, a lack of health in your life? So that's one thing. The second thing is you don't have to have an opinion on everything. 
You don't have to be chiming in on Twitter with your perspective on every single issue or getting involved in spats and making sure that everybody understands where you stand. I think a lot of that comes from uh, uh, not a true desire to have um, an even-handed, good faith discussion with somebody else, um, nor is it truly about trying to get that other person to change their mind. And I think often it's about signaling to your tribe that you're a member in good standing and that you adhere to that doctrine or that perspective. Um, the next thing I would say is that to the extent that you want to engage with somebody who shares a different point of view and you want to do that um, in good faith and with arms wide open, the best thing to do is to set aside your judgment, try to put yourself in their shoes, see the world through their perspective, and lead with vulnerability and curiosity. If you allow yourself to be vulnerable, if you admit you don't know everything, and you say, tell me about your life, tell me why you feel this way, and you genuinely try to compassionately understand that point of view, I think it's a good starting yeah. point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I tell people I don't watch the news anymore and I don't consume news, um, the common question is, and, and I grew up this way, you know, my dad had a newspaper delivered to the house every morning and would sit there and read it. And I, I grew up with that habit and I thought I was a news guy, you know, I'm an I'm a intelligent, productive member of society. I read the news, you know, I know what's going on in the world. Um, there is this idea that to be an engaged, productive member of society, you have to consume the news because that's how you find out what's going on. And I think it takes a lot to detach from that and go, well, wait a minute, who says I need to do that? I feel I'm a productive member of society and I do not consume news. I kind of feel that because I am on social media, I feel as something big enough happens, it will come into my my world mm -hmm. and I will see it. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's important. But I mean, I would say, sorry to interrupt, but I'll, I'll, let me just interject here. Like uh, at the, uh, at the uh, risk of one-upping you, I grew up in Washington, D.C. My dad was an inside the beltway attorney. I grew up with the children of politicians. I was immersed in politics, steeped in it. And I knew much more about how government in the United States worked when I was 18 years old than I do now. And the idea, like when you, when you grew up in Washington, that's all you talk about. You, I mean, that that's how is, you fit in, right? That's how you fit. Yeah, like you have to be up to speed on everything, have an opinion on everything. You know who all the players are. You know exactly what's going on all the time. And then I moved to California. Now I live in Southern California, and like a good hippie Californian, we got rid of our television like a decade ago. And I haven't watched the news in forever. I mean, I'm on Twitter, I'm on social media, and like yourself, if something happens, I'm aware of it. Like I'm, I'm up to speed on stuff, but it kind of seeps into my awareness passively as opposed to me consciously making sure that I'm sitting down to like tune CNN in or whatever. Um, and I think the question is, to that person who feels the obligation to be up to speed, again, like, is it helpful to society for you to be up to speed and, or is it helpful to you? Like, what are you holding on to here? How is this improving your life? How is this making you healthier, more productive? Or is it just, you feel like you're doing it because when you're at the pub or whatever, you wanna be able to engage in that conversation and you're afraid that you'll be judged if they're talking about something and you didn't hear about it that day. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, I think when I, when I, when I think about this topic, I think about, you know, we, we are both on social media, right? Um, I try my best as much as possible to engage with people who disagree with me in a very respectful and productive manner. I don't mind people disagreeing with me, but if you disagree with me respectfully, I will engage and I will respect your point of view and I will share with you my points of view. And people who follow me will have seen that over and over again. I will do that. But if you are rude to me and you say it with um, angst and there's some charge in what you're saying, often I will now choose not to respond. Do you block people? Uh, I do actually, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. What's interesting about you, and this was something that I had like written down to discuss with you during our podcast, but it didn't come up, is that 
you have made what I can only presume is a very conscious decision to not participate in the toxic nutrition wars that are taking place on Twitter, which I, you know, observe from a distance and never participate in. And sometimes I'll get tagged in some debate that's going on that just inevitably almost always ends up in the gutter somewhere. Um, but I would imagine that you've had to think about what your role is. And you've interviewed a bunch of doctors that do participate in this kind of stuff, as have I, um, as a medical practitioner and somebody who's written books on these subjects, do you feel like you need to chime in when the latest, you know, the, that when person X, who's kind of the leader of diet tribe X is, is having a debate with the leader of diet tribe Y and they're going at each other? You know, this is a great point, actually. <laughs> this is yeah. a great point. And, and I think it's worth exploring because I have thought long and hard about this. I have had varying opinions at various stages in my career. And I, I don't want to identify myself. I don't want to create an identity around myself, around a particular dietary tribe for multiple reasons. One reason is, is because as a doctor, I feel, and I have friends who do not feel this way, so there's not a slight on anyone else, but I feel that I should be diet agnostic in the sense that when someone comes in to see me, I want to be able to help them within their um, ethical and within their cultural views, how they choose to eat, let's say. I want to be able to help them around that. I don't want to, you know, I've seen so many people do so well on a variety of different diets. You know, I'm coming from a place of nearly 20 years of clinical experience, right? So I see people, they open up to me, they share things with me, I try various things. Nutrition is a big part of what I talk to my patients about. And I've seen different things work for different people. I've got to be honest, I think in a lot of these dietary wars, one of the problems is we've created an identity. Our identity, who we are, is this particular diet. And that can work for some people. As you said, you know, you do what's right for you on the podcast. You have figured out, look, maybe you're not the right fit for my show. Um, I will interview you. I'm not going to interview you. It's not a slight on them. The reason I don't get involved, A, I think I've made my position relatively clear in my first book uh, on what I think the overarching theme is of a good diet, which is a minimally processed diet. You know, whether you want to be vegan, or whether you choose uh, to eat meats and animal products, of course, there is an ethical argument, which I'm keeping separate from this, from a purely health perspective. Um, I just, A, it's confusing, I think, but B, I want to help every single person, right? I don't want, um, I don't want someone to be, this is not about, I've had an issue with wanting to be liked, right? My whole life, I think, and I think that's caused a few of my behavioral tendencies, I think it possibly started that way, that actually I don't want to offend, right? Mm -hmm. But I think I moved on. I really thought long and hard. I do sometimes chime in on Twitter uh, occasionally for various things, but very rarely, A, because I don't see, I don't, never see it being a particularly productive. No, it never, it doesn't, it's not like it ends well ever. Yeah, ever. <laughs> yeah, it just so. drains emotional yeah. energy from you, which Ultimately, when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. When I say yes to that, I'm often expelling emotional energy from myself, which I no longer have to give to my wife or my children. I have done that so much in the past. So I choose not to, but I do have my views on diets. And when I was with Tom Billy yesterday, you came up in conversation actually. And Tom, um, you know, Tom's view, uh, I don't want to put words into, into his mouth, but it, very clearly he thinks that keto is a great way to lose weight and have mental clarity. And he made the supposition that he thinks for 85% of people, that is the best way to do it. Now, I don't agree with that, right? And I, I did challenge Tom um, in a very respectful way, which, which we had a great chat about this. And I say, look, so, okay, Tom, I get that. That has been your experience. I totally get that. And you've got friends who've had that experience as well. We have a mutual friend in Rich, right? So Rich Roll has made various changes in his life. He is clearly a vegan athlete who has transformed his life in a number of ways, but one of those ways was by changing his diet. So what would you say to someone like Rich and, and a lot of people who follow him who have also transformed their diets by adopting a plant-based diet? And so we really try to unpack that a little bit because we were talking about identities and so beliefs. What do you say? 
What did he say? We said, look, you know, we've all got an equal, yeah. you know, he basically, uh, I could, you know, it was such a long conversation. I can't remember the conclusion of it. As you say, it never ends well, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a beautifully respectful dialogue that actually he accepted that everyone has different experiences. And so I said, so Tom, therefore, we've just been talking about these identities we create about us, we create around ourselves and these belief systems we have, and we spoke about absolute truths. So I said then, so Tom, is your belief that 85% of people will do best on a keto diet, is that an absolute truth or is it a belief system? And, you know, I think he accepted it at that point that, hey, you know what? And he, and he said, look, hey, look, I'm just saying this based on what I've seen. You clearly are a doctor who've seen tens of thousands of patients. So I, I totally get that we may have a different view on this. And I, and I sort of totally respect what you've seen. But this is why... You know, I have, I will interview, I purposely want to interview people who sh who have different perspectives, not only to each other, but also to me. I like talking to people who may challenge my worldview. And I can't remember who it was, but I had someone on my podcast and then I got a ton of abuse, I wouldn't say a ton of abuse, but I got some negativity that, oh, this means this is your favorite diet now. I'm like, hold on a minute. Since when does the podcast guest I choose to interview mean that that is my viewpoint. And it's, I think the whole dietary world has become toxic. I think we're confusing a lot of the public who actually want to make helpful change, but they see a lot of doctors and other uh, public figures who they respect, they see them fighting mm -hmm. quite viciously. And, and also, I just, I don't buy into that. I don't believe that you change the world by being vicious, by being confrontational. Be respectful, right? So that's my it's view. It's tough. It's tough because the nutritional science uh and the research out there is is difficult to really understand unless you steep yourself in it completely Le like reading the abstracts isn't enough um, a lot of that science is compromised by partisan interests and whoever is funding it and then there's the media cycle that picks up on these studies and then mischaracterizes them for clicks and all of that creates this witch's brew that just foments a ton of confusion and I think exacerbates the divide between these camps and makes it more and more difficult for people to communicate. But I do agree also that there's a lot of people who've crafted identities around their nutritional preferences. I think that's super unhealthy. And that's something that, that I've had to look at myself because I'm known as the vegan athlete. Um, and I wore that moniker proudly for a long time. And I've kind of, I'm still plant-based and I still feel great and I'm still an athlete and I'm all of those things, but I've kind of moved away from describing myself in that way because I don't want to be dogmatic and I don't want to be labeled. Those are, that's a dietary protocol that I adhere to and I believe in, and I've seen it you know, be transformative for a lot of people. Um, but I don't participate in any of those debates either. And I've kind of worked hard with my platform and the podcast to expand the aperture beyond just, hey, I'm a vegan athlete and that's what I'm going to talk about. Like I'm interested in personal growth across the board, emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, in all facets. I think diet, as we talked about during my podcast um, that you were just on and as, as you discuss in this book, is super important but it's one element in what it means to be healthy. And I changed my relationship with food, not so that I could get stuck in that place and talk about it for the rest of my life, but so that I could ener be energized to go out into the world and continue to grow and progress. And the problem when you do make it your identity, and again, until yesterday, I hadn't really unpacked this in my head, but it's something that I ended up discussing with Tom was, I actually think it's problematic. I think it can be super problematic in a way that we don't think it's problematic. When, you know, and, and, and in this era of social media where we have these cool little handles where we can actually make our preference, uh, you know, our, our identity can actually um, be part of our handle, then what happens if you change your view in two years and suddenly your handle and what you put out to the world is, you know, this is what I do. Well, but it makes you resistant to changing your exactly. perspective because you're so... 
uh, you're so attached to that identity that yeah. you become recalcitrant and calcified against anything that would uh, challenge that. For sure. And it closes you off. Like that is the the very nature of you know hardened bias. Like when you're so invested in this point of view and that's your identity, then even if even if the countervailing point of view is put in front of you and it's bulletproof, you're not going to be able to see that. Yeah. And so we're seeing this play out. I mean, we're talking about it in the context of the diet wars, but this is what's playing out politically. You're seeing it in Great Britain with Brexit. We're seeing it right now in the United States with, with Trump and everything that's going on. And it's left me thinking like, what is going, what is, what is happening right now across the planet that's leading to this kind of acrimony and inability to communicate, this divide that I think yeah. is threatening, you know, the well-being of our species, quite yeah. frankly. Rich, you mentioned there about change, that when people have, or people want to change, and it makes, when they have these belief systems, it makes it very hard for them to actually then go and take those constructive steps to change. And one thing we've not touched on is your story. And I know we unpacked that the very first time you came on the podcast, but I have a lot of new listeners since then, for sure. And I wonder, I think that the issue of change, many people listen to this podcast for inspiration, for um, ideas on how they can create positive change in their own life. So I wonder if you'd mind um, sort of briefly summarizing your story of change. I know you've done this many times in the yeah, past. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would I would preface my answer to that by saying that the biggest changes that I've made in my life have been um, have been forged through pain. You know, I've been in so much pain that uh, the idea of continuing to behave in the way that I was behaving was more painful than the fear I harbored about doing something differently. And I think that's something that people who have changed their lives in fundamental ways can relate to. For some reason, um, pain is a great lever uh, for implementing profound change in one's life. The good news is you don't have to be in tremendous pain to make those changes. Those changes that you seek are always available to you. Uh, it's just something about pain that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but to go into my story, I mean, I I grew up in Washington, D.C., two parents who love each other. All my needs were met. We grew up uh, initially middle class, and then my dad got a fancy job, and we, you know, he did well when I was in high school. Um, I went to a prep school. I got into all the fancy colleges. Like, when I was 18 years old, the world was my oyster. I got into Stanford. I got into Harvard. I was one of the best swimmers in the Eastern Seaboard. I got recruited to swim at colleges. I ended up going to Stanford, swimming on uh, a team that, that that won two NC2A championships, training with world record holders. Like, basically, I was in a posi a very, very privileged, rare position to essentially create the life of my dreams. Um, that uh, capsized when I was introduced to drugs and alcohol, and I kind of. Um, proceeded over the next 10 years to um, drain the uh, drain the ambition out of my life and 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 uh, have it kind of all go down a bottle and it wasn't an overnight thing um, but ultimately you know alcohol uh, uh, destroyed my ambitions it destroyed my relationships it prevented me from achieving my potential as an athlete. Uh, it de derailed my career. There wasn't any aspect of my life that wasn't damaged by my relationship to alcohol. And it took me to some very dark places such that at the very end, I was alienated from my family. I was teetering on getting fired. I was looking at jail time from two consecutive DUIs. Like my life was a wreck. Um, and ultimately it's a long story, but I ended up in, in a treatment center in Oregon. Uh, when I was 31 and I made that place my home for a hundred days, which is a pretty long wow. time to be in rehab. Uh, and that experience saved my life and was, was the first, um, it was my introduction to understanding that perhaps there was a different way to live other than this relentless consumerist, materialist, um, capitalistic, fueled uh, pursuit of the American dream that had kind of underscored every decision that I'd made as a young person. 
Um, it was explained to me uh, that I was a spiritual being having a human experience, which was something that took me a long time to grok. Uh, and I started to uh, learn new tools for how to live my life, um, tools that I still rely on to this day. And in the wake of that uh, treatment center experience, I went back into the world and set about repairing all my relationships and trying to be a productive member of society again. But my evolution was still very much in its nascent stages because the kind of overarching goal that I was seeking was to um, kind of get back on top, right? Like be that guy that I was when I was 18. And what that looked like for me was becoming a partner in a prestigious law firm and having the nice fancy car and getting all this stuff and being the person that people would point to and say, he's got the cool job or he's doing, you know, like, he, like all the things that society programs and tells you are what's required to, you know, kind of, um, be successful. Uh, and not once during that period of time, did I ever stop and rely on some of these spiritual tools that I thought that I understood, but didn't quite understand and ask myself, who are you? Like, what, what do you think you're here to do on planet earth? How can you contribute? What gets you excited in the morning? Like, what do you think your passion or your ikigai could be? Like those questions never even occurred to me. I was just on this habit trail, on this upward track, like climbing this ladder. And I think I was repressing a lot of those, um, a lot of those thoughts or instincts that were trying to gain purchase in my mind because uh, I really didn't like what I was doing for a living. Like it never really resonated with me. I was just doing it because I thought that's what people like me are supposed to do. And I couldn't understand why I dreaded going to work in the morning and why um, I would get so frustrated and why I had this compulsion prior to getting sober that I had to get super drunk every night after leaving the law firm. And how that manifested ultimately was in this um, collision of this existential crisis that I was harboring that kind of collided with a health scare because I wasn't taking, during that decade long period after from 31 to 39, I was just doing the law firm, work, you know, workaholic thing, not taking care of myself, not sleeping well, fast food addict, you know, the whole nine yards, the whole package of like not being healthy, um, such that I had this moment where I was walking up a flight of stairs to go to sleep after a long day at work. And I had to pause, like I had tightness in my chest and really thought I was on the precipice of having something terribly wrong with my heart. Was heart that here? It was yes. here. Yeah. On the staircase right out there where you just... We were there a couple minutes ago. Um, and uh, it was a scary moment. Heart disease runs in my family. My grandfather, who I'm named after, who was also a champion swimmer at the University of Michigan in the late 1920s, died of a heart attack when he was 54. I'm now 53. Uh, and I realized that I could no longer continue to live the way that I was living. And it was very reminiscent of the day that I woke up and decided today's the day I'm going to rehab. You know, it was one of those moments where, where, um, where uh, the need to change met the desire to change. You know, and I think we're all visited with moments like this in our life um, that generally pass us by because we're not mindful or aware or present enough to recognize them. And I was lucky enough to capture lightning in a bottle that day I decided to get sober. And I'd often reflected on that and thought, what if that day I made a different decision? Would I ever have made it to treatment? Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe my life would have gone in a totally different direction. And because I had reflected on that when I was on that staircase, I had a very palpable sense that, that this, again, I was being blessed with another such opportunity that if I could grab onto it, Perhaps I could make make another like hard left in my life that could that could have, you know, that level of profundity in terms of change, or I could let it pass me by and just write it off and like oh, I'll be fine. You know, maybe I should go to the gym a little bit. But I did have the presence of mind and the wherewithal to like hold on to that and grab onto that, and and that's what prompted me to then make changes in my relationship to food and then later with respect to fitness and it's a long story but ultimately that led me into 
this world of ultra endurance where I had unfinished business as an athlete to kind of um, prove some things to myself. But also it was very much a spiritual journey of trying to reconnect with my being to try to better understand you know, what my ikigai could possibly be. And there's something about training for these super long races where you're spending an incredible amount of time in solitude. It's almost like going on a Vipassana retreat. Uh, and then the sort of low grade pain that you're in that strips away everything extraneous and forces you to confront yourself in a really profound way that became the crucible or the engine for me to help answer these questions about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this conversation, there's loads more like it on my channel. Please do press subscribe and hit that bell. Now, back to the conversation. I think I said this to you before. I believe we discussed this idea that most people overestimate what they can do in a short period of time, whether it's a month or six months or a year, and wildly underestimate what they're capable of accomplishing over a decade or a number of years. And I think that's why people, pe uh, part of why people peter out on New Year's resolutions, like they're not seeing the results that they want right away. They haven't created a structure um, with interim goals and deadlines, you know, built into that where they can measure their progress incrementally and they lose enthusiasm for it. So if I do have any kind of special skill, it isn't that I'm an innately talented athlete or a naturally gifted podcaster. It's that I appreciate the journey itself and I'm willing to put in the work when no one's no, when no one's looking. And I've learned over time in every facet of my life that that work pays off over time, but you have to be unbelievably patient and resist that um, sense that uh, that sense of entitlement that you get, that when you under, undertake something difficult, that you need to be reaping the rewards. Like I, I'm just about the work and the process itself. And I've been lucky enough to engage in processes that I love so that I enjoy the journey itself. But by simply being about that journey and that process, that's that's why I've been able to you know move my life into the place that it yeah. is today. I mean, thanks for sharing that, Rich. It's, it's very, very powerful. Um, I've been diving deep into Ryan Holiday's books over the last few days, um, and what's interesting is I, as I, as I learn more about Stoicism, and I think about Eastern philosophies and Western philosophies. What you have just been summarizing there is actually something that I feel Eastern and Western philosophies, although can seem quite different at times, where they really do converge is on the idea of process over outcome, journey over destination. You know, whether it's the Stoics talking about it, or whether it's Lord Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita talking about not enjoying the fruits of your labor, you know, you do the labor for the sake of the labor. Um, you really, I think you beautifully demonstrate in that, that it you didn't have a goal to be the number whatever podcast in the world, or it to be this big juggernaut of a show, which is listened to all around the globe. It was a commitment you made to yourself. I'm releasing once a week, every week without fail. And that word to yourself, I think, is very powerful. A lot of us break the words that we make to ourselves. And I think that's potentially the start of when friction starts to arrive in our life, which can mm -hmm. lead us down a slippery slope. But I want to know, Rich, that vow you made to yourself, if vow is not, you know, overreaching, was it always a good thing or did at times it become a noose around your neck? Yeah, I would say it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think there's a, uh, this is particular to me and a little bit of self-understanding. Like I'm somebody who, who is a bit of an extreme personality uh, and I need these rules to like stay on track, right? Because I know for myself, if I missed a week, nothing changes. Like the earth still spins on its axis and I can still release an episode later than that. But 
personally, if I break that rule, then it just becomes easier to break it again. And I know myself well enough to know that if I break it once, maybe I won't break it again in the next month, but six months later, I'll be like, well, you know, I, I, I didn't put up an episode that week, so I can, I can do another week. Like, what's the big deal? And then it'll be a month before I do it again. And then I'll just break it all the time. Like, I, I just know that about myself, which is why I create these rules for myself. And I do it across the board in various aspects of my life. Like, I don't eat meat or dairy. I have that rule for myself. I don't drink or take drugs. Like, that's a hard rule for myself. And I need those in order to kind of stay on track. Now, those rules can also work across purposes with your goal if you are too rigid about them. This works for me. And I try to create rules that are that are still very doable in the construct of my life. I think the problem occurs when you establish a rule that isn't sustainable, right? So putting one podcast up a week, it's not that hard. Like it's, it's pretty sustainable. Um, but if I was to say, I'm gonna put a podcast up every single day, I wouldn't have lasted very long before I broke that rule. And perhaps I would have flamed out on podcasting altogether and just quit. So the trick is, creating guidelines, um, you know, sort of signposts along the way that you, you know, privately adhere to that are sustainable and workable within the construct of your life that are still healthy and manageable, but also difficult enough that they keep you honest. I think the macro rule, if you're to telescope up to 30,000 feet is really, are you living your life intentionally or are you living your life reactively? And I think a lot of people are living vast aspects of their life in reaction to the world around them rather than intentionally in accordance with, you know, a plan or a rubric or, you know, a set of personal guideposts to help them make the proper decisions to lead them in the direction they want to go. And it's never been more easy to live your life reactively. Like we're constantly stimulated. We've deprived ourselves of the ability to be bored, to engage in our you know, creative minds. Um, we don't have the downtime that we used to have. We're too busy, too stressed, underrested, you know, overly stimulated. And I think when you're in that state, it's very easy to live your life on autopilot and just proceed, this is my life, this is what I do, and never step outside of it to question or to analyze why is it that you're doing things those way, this way? Is there a better way? Is this leading me where I need or want to go? Uh, and then years go by until you reach some inflection point or you know, endure some kind of crisis that forces you to stop and take inventory uh, of how you're living and make appropriate changes. So really, you know, the rules or the guideposts, whether it's I'm putting up a podcast a week or I'm going to wake up at this time of day or I'm going to exercise three times a week or I'm going to eat these foods and not these foods or I'm going to go to bed at this particular time or no screens, you know, within an hour of sleep or whatever it is. Um, I think being proactive about those things, making a commitment to yourself is an act of self-love uh, and then recruiting community for purposes of accountability to keep you on track. These are tools that I've deployed and employed in various aspects of my life, both in the podcast and outside of the podcast to simply be a better human and to live more consciously, mindfully, and intentionally. And I think that's applicable to everybody, no matter who you are or you know where you find yourself on this carousel of life. How do you deal with the scenario where a guest is sitting opposite you and they're a bit nervous and they may not be giving their best account of themselves. You know, what can we learn potentially from how you manage that situation? I mean, has it happened much? Mm -hmm. And when it does happen, do you have a process and a strategy to try and help them through? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think I I, I hadn't really experienced much of that um, until the last couple of years. And I would say that I struggled with the idea of beginning to film the podcast for that very reason. Um, I felt it important to evolve the show into a visual format and to be able to share it on YouTube. And that's, you know, had its own evolution. But I was also very aware as somebody who who really is, you know, going for the emotional connection that once you introduce a camera into the equation, you know, people tend to act differently. Even the most polished, confident, relaxed person is going to be a little bit more, you know, back straight up when they know there's a camera staring at them. So that's something that, um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out. And with the new studio, we're going to be able to move the cameras back and try to make them less obtrusive. But there is a certain person who gets really rigid and nervous uh, and that is heightened by the introduction of a camera. And when that occurs, and it has happened a few times, I mean, all I try to do is, is you know, lighten the mood. And, you know, if I have to shift gears and ask them about something I feel like they're really at ease talking about, um, that's what I'll do to try to get them to relax or tell a joke or get them to forget that there's a camera or a microphone in front of them. And once I can get them engaged with a particular subject matter that they care about or that they're passionate about, everything else starts to fall away. Uh, I also think eye contact is really important with that as well. If I can maintain eye contact with that person and just really give them that sense, like it's okay, you're safe here. Um, and I'll do that through just, you know, facial expressions or, or my personal demeanor. And sometimes it takes a few minutes, but to cajole them into that sense that it's gonna be okay. And then once you get them rolling, and they for everything else drops away, and it's just two people looking at each other. Then it's it's back on track. Yeah, I mean, I love that, and I th I think there's a lot there that many of us can learn from that. You know, when people are struggling, when people are not at their best, when people don't feel safe, let's lean in, let's connect, mm -hmm. let's smile, let's talk about things that they like talking about. That is that human connection because. Those little facial expressions. I mean, it, it's funny. I think on maybe my last appearance on your show or the one before that, I think I sort of said, well, it's, it's interesting. I feel that I've been podcasting my entire life, even though I've only technically been podcasting mm -hmm. for, you know, coming up to three years because I've been seeing patients for nearly 20 years. So what do I do? I sit down and I talk and... I always think about connecting first before trying to uh, give them any education or wisdom that I may feel they need to share. I, I learned very early that you connect first once you've connected, that once they know that you actually care, they're all ears. And mm -hmm. so I feel I bring hopefully the skill I have in the consultation room into the podcast realm. Of course, it's different. But it's not as different as you might imagine, actually, because ultimately it's human connection, right? Yeah. Well, in your in your office, a patient comes in and that's a safe environment. And whatever they say to you is protected by law, right? So you're creating an environment in which they feel safe and they need to feel safe in order for you to treat that patient. And I would say in my case, there's a couple things that I employ. The first thing is that um, if I have that sense that somebody is nervous, I lead with I lead with vulnerability. Like I'll I'll share something about myself that I'm embarrassed about, uh, and that's basically my way of saying like it's okay. Like you can be vulnerable here. I can't expect you to be vulnerable if I'm not going to be vulnerable. Um, and so I try to set the tone in that regard. And in the way that you kind of learned how to podcast by the way that you interact with your patients in the treatment room, I had two great educations that in retrospect, looking back, were, were training grounds for being an effective podcast host. The first is thousands of hours spent in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings through the process of getting recovery. And you know, for people who are unfamiliar with what that world is all about, you basically sit in rooms and people get up and share the most vulnerable 
aspects of their life. And they do it with courage and with humor. And it's quite inspiring, you know, to, to, to hear people get up who at one point in their life were utterly broken and share how they pieced things together and do it in a way where they're relating stories that to the normal person would seem horrifying. There's something so beautiful and inspirational about that. Um, and that's where I learned how to be a public speaker on, because I would do the same. I would get up and, and, and share my story. Um, and it gave me such a profound appreciation for the power of vulnerability and the power of storytelling and the power of personal narrative. And a big impetus or motivation in me starting the podcast was I wanted to give the broader public a taste or a sense of what that experience is like, because irrespective of whether you're a drug addict or an alcoholic, I think there's so much that can be gleaned and learned from that type of experience. And I wanted to recreate aspects of that in the conversations that I'm hosting. The second training ground for me was as an attorney, yeah. where I took you know, a zillion depositions. <laughs> I just sit across from somebody who's in an antagonistic position from me, the opposite of vulnerability, where they're trying to protect themselves at all costs and learn how to ask the right questions to elucidate the kind of information that I'm trying to get. So one is the first is a very touchy feely thing. And the second is a very practical kind of information extraction um, process. And I think the two of those together have uh, you know served me well as a host. If you enjoyed that conversation, I really think you're going to enjoy the one I had with Professor BJ Fogg from Stanford, all about habits. It's right there. So give it a click and let me know what you think. The feeling of success is what wires in the habit. Emotions create habits. And specifically in tiny habits, what we focus on is...